So hi, everyone. Welcome to another book discussion with facilitators from the Unerased Book Club. Tonight, we are discussing a short story collection called How to Pronounce Knife. And this is by Subankam Talavanska. And um, before we start, let's just go around and give a quick introduction as to who we are. I will begin. Um, I'm Lucy. I'm a li library technician in the youth department, and I do uh, other programming besides that. I am a female with white skin and shoulder-like brown hair, wearing glasses, and sitting in front of a wall of watercolor paintings. Hi, my name is Jacob. I am an employee at Ann Arbor District Library where I work in the outreach department. I am a 28 year old white male with blondish hair. I got a beard. I'm sitting in front of my kitchen, my kitchen wall, which is um, a white wall. Um, I'm Elizabeth. I am a library technician in the archives at the Ann Arbor District Library. I'm a 31 year old white female sitting in front of a white wall with some plants to my right. Hi, my name is Audrey. I am a librarian at the Ann Arbor District Library. I am a 31 year old white female, just doing the math real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I have dark brown hair uh, that's up in a bun. Uh, I wear glasses and I'm sitting in front of two paintings, one of a very colorful elephant. Hi, my name is Heidi, and I'm a desk clerk at the Ann Arbor District Library. I am a 47-year-old white woman with a brunette blondish hair that is tied up in a bun as well, and I'm wearing black frame glasses. I'm using one of our wonderful meeting rooms at the Westgate Branch, so I have a photo of Amy Joy Donuts kind of behind me, a bit of a white wall and a green wall. I'm kind of pointed towards a corner. Hi folks, I'm Fatma Haq. I am a facilitator, co-facilitator for the Unerased Book Club. I am a 35-year-old brown uh, South Asian woman with the black hair, and uh, I have a blurred digital background uh, of my bedroom, so. Sorry, just trying to press the unmute there. Uh, <laughs> hey everyone, my name is Sheila Lal. Um, I am a a uh, 31 year old uh, South Asian woman, uh, light skinned, shoulder length black hair. And uh, behind me is a virtual background of Adams Peak in Sri Lanka. And I'm the founder of the Honorace Book Club and co facilitator alongside Fatima. And I'm so excited that so many people have joined today to talk about how to pronounce knife, which is a collection of short stories um, about. Uh, Laotian refugees in Canada. This is the first time we've uh, read a book um, set in Canada. Um, the, our book club usually centers Asian American authors. Um, I made an exception this year to read How to Pronounce Knife because Laotian stories are so important and so erased, hence the title of our book club, Unerased Book Club. Um, but they're usually erased in the context of um, what does American foreign policy look like in Southeast Asia, but then also what does it mean to be in community with Asian Americans who you may not think prescribe to a specific idea of Asian Americanness. Um, so I'm really excited that so many people joined us to read today. And um, I just we like to open it up to general questions of how did you feel about this this book? I thought I really loved. Uh, it, I thought the writing was really like, um, I don't want to say evocative exactly, but like, it was just very like, um, I don't know, it made me like really feel what the characters were kind of going through. Um, although I will say one of the things that was like really a thread throughout the story was this kind of like undercurrent of like sadness and like not getting, not having the life you exactly wanted, um, and the different ways that characters tried to like get like get some sort of happiness or like try and achieve the life that they wanted that I thought was really interesting like I really loved reading this but also I would like put it down and be like I feel so sad now <laughs> um so that was my like overall impression um I would I would agree with what you just said Audrey yeah, it was they were really enjoyable stories but it was 
you're left at the end. Like it's, it's, it is kind of sad. And it's almost like, what was the life this character even expected? Like they're at this point of like, I don't, what was it I wanted or something? I don't know. You're kind of left feeling with a bit of a loss of just like how work and daily living and daily relationships just time passes. <laughs> it's like, now here you are. And so it, uh, I really enjoyed the collection. It was, it was very easy to take on, but also there's just so much depth to, and a lot of them are not very, they're not very long. So really short stories. So yeah, it was a great choice. And with so much of it being about domesticity, domesticity, <laughs> and um, like things that happen in the workplace, um, I thought that was a really interesting way to kind of reveal the different ways that society was set up in a way where it was working against these characters for reasons out of their control. I thought a lot of this book is about longing for things and then the way that the world is set up is these characters can be very slight chance that they will achieve the things that they're longing for. Um, I especially think of that last story, Picking Worms, I thought that did a really wonderful job of setting up or, or, or showing us this is how the world is set up in a way that is against brown people, refugees, um, in a really clear, concise way. These, these stories were sh so short, but they said so much. Yeah, I agree, Jacob. That last story really like struck me and I was like yelling out loud as I was reading it. But um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, the whole thing was really enjoyable in the sense that it was well written. There was a lot going on, not enjoyable in the sense of like what everyone said. Um, there was a lot of things going on that the characters couldn't control, as we've said. Um, and yeah, I kind of just wanted to know more about a lot of them, like when it was finished, um, like what's happening. And then um, I did enjoy the like threads that ran through, like she used a lot of the same themes and like symbolism throughout the stories. Like she talks about puzzles a lot and then um, like the workplace stuff that happens and like all the microaggressions that are happening in that environment. Yeah, I just, um, to agree with what everyone said, I also really liked this collection. I did find them sad. I liked the, the length and that they were short. I think that she did a really good job just using the words she needed to use and not um, adding a lot of extra. And I think that that's, um, that's what makes them so good. I also think there was some humor in these stories, um, especially there were parts where, you know, the characters had a lot of conviction behind what they were saying. Like for instance, the title story, when she was like, no, it is pronounced this way. Or when, um, the girls go well, trick or treating, you know, in the end, they, they tell the teacher, no, we, we, it was, you know, chica cha or whatever it is they say, or, um, the, the man who was saying yes, sir, all the time, but the tone that he was saying it in was, you know, fuck you. And it's like, that's what I'm thinking in my brain. And so like those little moments of how people were, um, sort of gaining strength, I, I think I really liked finding those in there. So I read this all in one sitting, which uh, I, I was on a flight. It was very long, so it just worked out. Um, but what I what really struck me was it was almost like these short stories were more like vignettes um, and that we really got a huge breadth of experiences for this uh, population of uh, Laotian Canadians um and I was I was really impressed with that because one you could tell that these are really intimate portraits of people um and that the author has personal knowledge of these individuals and these stories and I really appreciated that like you could feel the richness immediately um and then the other ones were the the little bits of like human rebellion um the struggle with dignity the struggle to kind of like and not so much make a good life as it is just to live in a way that is um, somewhat satisfying, but still with dignity. Like that was a theme that kept coming up again and again for me. And, and that despite people, systems, structures, trying to take away that dignity, I really sense like the power behind individuals. Some of the things that struck me the most were 
when they were like describing the refugee camps in Thailand or other places. And, and it was just it, like mind boggling to me how they'd say, oh yeah, we spent 11 years in this like camp with all these folks or something like that. And I just, I know that's the reality, but it just, my mind, my very privileged American raised mind does not, it doesn't compute in the same way. Like how, how is that a thing? Right. Um, so yeah, in a lot of ways, I found the narratives challenging, but also really satisfying. Yeah, no, definitely same. Um, so I, we chose this book before we read it. Um, and it was purely based on the types of reactions that we saw online to the set of short stories. And, um, what I really appreciated about this collection is while there's a lot of similarities in how um, refu- the first generation of refugee transplants like process trauma in real time and the relationship, the strained relationship for the most part with their children who have no context, but also really just want to assimilate, the characters that we spend the most time with aren't trying to assimilate into white Canadianness. They're just trying to like Fatima said, like live a life of dignity and trying to piece together a life that they could have had if they had were able to live in peace at home um, and kind of replicate that. And that's a, a narrative that, in my opinion and in my experience, we don't get to see a lot with uh, both immigrant and refugee narratives where it is all about how do we fit in with the majority culture or perceived majority culture, not how can we just... Um, live our lives honestly to ourselves. Um, I can't remember which story it is, but there's one where uh, the, I think it's a child narrator and it may be the first story um, is talking about like going to Laotian like uncle parties and seeing their mom and their dad like interact with people who speak the same language and how just more vibrant their parents become to them when they're in a space where that experience is valued and wanted. Um, and it, it was glimpses into how another community feels at home. That was really important for me to see in this set of stories. That reminds me of one of the stories. I think it was the Randy Travis story. Yes. Um, and the dad wants to eat traditional foods and the mom like just wants to eat gross fried American food um and then the dad is like gonna take her to see Randy Travis so she because she's getting what she wants she starts making him this food and then the daughter is like oh I actually this is amazing I don't know why we don't do this all the time like (laughs) it's happening and then what really took me out about that particular story is it ends with them with, with with the daughter being an adult and then her father starts doing some beautiful Randy Travis karaoke. And it's like, he's finally, his wife had so um, desperately wanted to be close to whiteness that became his goal as well, to the point where he's all alone in his apartment singing Randy Travis, beautifully, albeit. But I, that and the last story, I thought were some of the most successful um, stories that that really laid out the thinking behind um, certain things she was trying to express, like proximity to whiteness, um, discrimination in the workplace, nepotism. Um, but I also, I, 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 I do love Randy Travis. So that was another connection to that story as well. I thought in that, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say that I, one of the stories that I think also really illustrated the work the work the like knock-on effects of workplace discrimination was the I think second to last one with the two girls in the apartment complex and how like when they grow up the white girl has become like you know a, a lawyer like who we don't know what but like a professional and the um Laotian girl is like doing like a more like w- blue collar job probably so just like the ways that like get like different people are able to get ahead more easily, like how that then transfers down to their kids, I thought was really, like she did it in a way that I thought was like really effective because um, it's easy to 
it's easy, I think, particularly with like our Amer- American culture to think of it as just like you in your life and your like your life is yours. Um, but I think that she showed how like your circumstances um, and your parents' circumstances are like connected mm-hmm. very intimately. I'm curious, like, did other folks think on the Randy Travis story that it was the mother's desire to be closer to whiteness that drove her to do those things or uh, or something else? Well, one thing that struck me about that story, which I was going to say before, um, like with the food piece, mm-hmm. is that they, they do talk about one reason why she stopped cooking that food is that she had to go really far to get to get the ingredients and it took like three days to make it. So this is a cost to her, um, not only of going to buy the food, but of her time. And so I think that um, that was interesting to me a little bit of that, like the, even the mental burden that she would carry of having to come up with ways to get that. Um, So I don't know if it was, like in that case, trying to be closer to whiteness as opposed to like, or maybe in some ways, but here's this option that offers me a great savings to my time and, um, you know, in my workload. And so then I can find something else that I enjoy. Um, but that was something that struck me about that. Cause did you mention how, how, far she had to go to get the food and how long it took to prepare it and she was like i would have to ferment the fish sauce and i don't want to do that that would take three days like yeah like imagine a world where you're not getting fish sauce at every grocery store right it just it to me i mean i know that that happens right i grew up um i grew up in a community of bengali immigrants where they um they didn't have access to all the things that they typically cooked with. And then they would like sneak it in through, you know, past customs, you know, folded in the folds of saris or other clothing and, and inside of like Dano, which is a brand of um, dehydrated milk powder. And so like they would hide it in those cans to kind of disguise it. Like it's, it's, it was a whole smuggling operation really, but it was, very basic ingredients of spices, you know, not the stuff that you can now buy very readily in stores, but it, people had to go to those lengths to, to get what they needed in order to make the food that was familiar um, to them. Yeah. I just was going to jump on with like what Lucy was talking about with preparing the food and everything and like with not having the right ingredients. And she's saying it's not going to taste the same. And it's almost like it would be more heartbreaking in a way to be eating it and be like, just you're disappointed by your food. And that would really stir up so many other things. So like not to keep bringing back sadness, but it was like, that's how I kind of felt about it. I was like, yeah, it's like you, you're, you're just out of touch with your, where you're from and, and not having access to those things. Wow. Yeah. I really thought the Randy Travis thing was very connected to like almost a lifestyle or like that he represented just the like effortlessness of people who like match the dominant culture in a way, if that makes sense. Like that was the thing that was really appealing was a fantasy of like, I could, of like being able to escape, you know, having to go to make fish sauce for three days or whatever, and just listen to this man who represents like wealth and is handsome and I don't know what he looks like actually, but presumably young and to like have him sing to you. <laughs> um, like that would be like a nice place to escape from if your life is going differently than you thought it would. Yeah. I also kind of saw it. I think I don't want to mix up the stories, but I think this is the one where she becomes addicted to gambling afterwards. So it just seemed like it was not necessarily like, yes, it was about what you just said, Audrey. I think that's a really good point. Um, But it was also about her filling a void of something that she like, she had no community there. So she turned to these like things that were distant, but she felt like it was a big part of her life. Yeah. I, she died in the parking lot, right. Of the casino. That's saying something. I just don't know what. (laughs) That was incredibly tragic. Um, 
and and I also didn't know how to what to make sense of it. But yeah, for me, it definitely felt like this was a story about her mental health and trying to her best to keep her head above water, um, and just do finding something that would fill that um, you know that void as you described, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, I, so fascinating. In a completely different thread, I really enjoyed the two stories. Uh, they felt very similar to me. One was of an accountant and uh, just being in the middle of nowhere. Like I just imagined um, like the middle of nowhere, Vermont or like that equivalent. Um, and then the other was of the older woman who had um, a relationship with, with her neighbor. Mm-hmm. And I just really loved like the ability to be selfish in this set of stories where we know that selfishness is not something that you can put ahead of all of the other things that you experience in your life. Um, I I just, I don't know. They're both like, they both read like short stories that you would read from a dominant culture writer, Mm -hmm. not from a writer who's trying to explore the multifacetedness of refugee life. And it's so refreshing and something I think about a lot. Like I'm currently reading another set of short stories um, for fun. And I like kept imagining the characters as black. And like, that's what I, I thought it was by a black author. So I just assumed that all the characters were black and it made the story so much more interesting to imagine like what it's like to not have to explain away parts of yourself to have these, um, these types of, simple not simple narratives but you know a narrative that doesn't have to do with trauma and then I looked at the the author's picture I was like oh no she's white so these characters are probably because there's an absence of discussion of race and ethnicity they're probably white but I'm going to continue to imagine that they're black anyway and that's what we got from those two in my opinion got from those two stories in how to pronounce knife is like the absence of but like in a very empowering way yeah, it's that feeling of like I'm I'm just waiting to read stories that go beyond the the well traversed narratives that we're familiar with, right? Like uh, I the, I think it's kind of the way the only similarity I can think about is like how women's stories of any any race, you know, used to be around their romantic relationships. And we were like, we want women who have other interests than their romantic pursuits, right? And we want to see that story. And when we finally started seeing it, um, we were like, yes, this is what we wanted, whether it's friendship between women or women in career and or just a woman traveling and having fun, whatever that case may be. Um, I think it's the same thing with immigrant stories um, or stories from other um, races and and I think there's that same desire, especially from from folks who are perhaps first, you know, second generation um, in. Cool. So um, I one of the discussion questions that was posed um, uh, the, on our website, posted on our website, what I actually had to do with um, the value of names. Um, and I was, I definitely noticed that we didn't get a lot of names in the these stories right away. So I was curious about what folks thought about that um, and the value, you know, like how you felt about characters who are not named and what is the value behind a name? The first thing I think of was um, the one about Red and Samboom, I think was his name. Um, And he called her the um, Laotian word for Red. And he called, she called him Sam. Um, So they both were on like totally different wavelengths of like, he was celebrating her Laotian-ness and he, she was trying to assimilate. And also it was about nose jobs and um, like her wanting to get a nose job and all the women there wanting nose jobs because it would make them more successful. Um, So yeah, it was about like Eurocentric beauty standards in that sense. I think a lot of the tension that I noticed around names throughout the stories, it had to do a lot with like either culture being like the dominant culture being put on you. Like the one I thought of was um, Jai and 
Jay, like how his um, wife starts calling him Jay. And he's like, no, I want to be Jai. And like th- that story even like explains how to pronounce it um, so that you like really get the like full meaning or like the full impact, I think, of when she's like, now nah, you're Jay. Um, or and then there were people like the story about the mother and the daughter where the daughter um, decides that she's like Cynthia now or C- Celeste. Like she decides to stop going by her Laotian name. Um, so like the themes I picked up with names were like when they were mentioned, there was like a it was almost like you that's you could really see the tension between like what was going on with how characters were like relating to each other or to like their place in the world through cult like the culture they were interacting with yeah yeah i actually um like was really interested in in the names where there was an absence of names you know like in the the story with jai when it's like there's um he has a name and the woman that his wife is with has a name but she's just always called the bus driver's wife um or there's the story with the, the manicures and pedicures where the the sister doesn't have a name, um, but but the brother does. And I was reading an interview with the author and she was talking about that. And she was saying that um, some characters for her are so brilliant that she doesn't want to name, she feels like to give them a name would subtract from that brilliance, which was really interesting to me because that was not the answer that I expected when I was, when I was um, looking for, you know, why she chose to name some and not the other. So I just thought that was a really um, interesting way to view that and sort of a more, um, less about not naming someone in a negative way and like a, I'm not gonna give them a name or they are nameless. It's like, they're they're too much for a name. There's not a name I could pick for them because if I called them Susan, you would put Susan in there and you would miss some of who they are. That's really cool because I was just thinking that how once you name it, yeah, it can be distracting. It, it's like, yeah, you, you put it like an expectation on the character. And so those stories were just, yeah, that, that vignette and that story on its own. And it's also interesting too, because if it's a narration, it's like you're just in their head and you don't, they know their name. It's like, they don't have to be saying who they are. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, I, it does give it a different depth for sure. Yeah. I really like that just um, in, I mean, I know that like for a lot of Chinese Americans, they have their anglicized names and then their Ch- Mandarin name and they go by one at home, one by one in public. Um, and like in many South Asian cultures, there's a real fissure between names that are like very much rooted in those cultures and the names that can be easily pronounced by others. But like, who are those others? Um, and I don't know enough Southeast Asian Americans, uh, people who were either born here or who are having children here if they weren't born here, um, to understand what that potential cultural rift looks like. And and I love the idea that we are more than our names. Mm -hmm. Our names get us to places, but we have so many more aspects to who we are besides the name that is put upon us. And this is a very brilliant example of how a name can just be, like you said, Heidi, just be completely distracting. It's um, interesting for me because um, right after I finished reading this book, I um, was attending a conference um, this past week. And uh, it, during one of the, the meals that we were all sitting, it was an all women's conference. And uh, um, one of the one of the participants was uh, was saying that she was sick of having to explain what she was doing. So could we pick another question to get to know each other? And so someone said, well, let's hear the story behind your name, because your name is really beautiful. And so that actually launched an entire conversation where people were sharing the stories behind their names and how they what it means or where it came from or some of the associated histories with that. We actually spent an hour just like talking about our names going around the table of like six or seven people and it was very powerful and at the end of it I felt so much more connected to the other participants and just remembering that I mean I put a lot of uh, weight into my own name journey as I like to think of it because of you know going from anglicized pronunciations to readopting the Bangladeshi pronunciation um 
and then also like consistently having to work to make sure that people are c- pronouncing it correctly. So it's always a present thing for me um, in any situation. Uh, so, so it was really, really cool. And I think there's a lot of power behind it, but this alternative of how naming can somehow reduce or take away power from someone's story is also very fascinating. Yeah. I was just thinking as you were saying that, like, unless you change your name, you don't choose your name, your parents choose your name, um, which kind of ties back to things we've talked about previously with like the parents' circumstances influencing the outcomes of the children's lives and their experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. I'm curious if anybody on this call was familiar with um, Laotian culture or the situation that drove uh, the refugee crisis into into the West. Well, um, similar to uh, the book we read last we, last month, <laughs> um, it's all part of the same uh, Kissinger anti communist uh, American foreign policy mess of let's bomb them out and hope that communism doesn't spread. And Laos, uh, the violence in Laos was really the secret war. Um, there was the most number of bombs dropped in the in the what's now Laos. And um, to add insult to injury, a lot of Hmong people who were American allies came from Laos and were uh, the first to be, uh, I can't think of words, but basically the first to be attacked um, when Americans pulled out. Um, So if you know anybody who's Hmong, like that's part of their history. Um, And the uh, one of the county commissioners in Macomb County is Hmong American. So this is a very uh, like it's in your face if you're in southeast Michigan. Um, And then there are other people who are obviously impacted by just being bombed out by the American government. And there's still many, many uh, unexploded ordinances throughout the country. So if you go to visit um, and you go to visit even the, the big UNESCO World Heritage sites, there's signs everywhere that say, stay on the path, do not move off the path. This has not been cleared. You like Kids still are, um, if they go after a ball or after a toy, are still uh, at, at high risk of being hurt by an unexploded ordinance. So that's like a little bit of context to the, the wave of Laotian refugees to Canada and the United States. I feel a little bit silly saying this, but honestly, my first uh, awareness or interaction with um, Laos or Laotian character was from King of the Hill, <laughs> that cartoon, because they had a character and everybody was like, who is this guy? Where is he from? And yeah, so, <laughs> but that's a whole other thing. We don't need to go any deeper in that, but that's just my, yeah, my experience. That's why it was, it was really exciting to pick up this book to get more depth. <laughs> To be fair, Heidi, I think that's everybody's first and only (laughs) interaction. Yeah, I was uh, really unaware as well. I've been learning more and more through this book club and through some of the things that we've been reading and some of the documentaries I've been watching about the Vietnam um, War, but I honestly just did not have enough contextual history. And I think that goes to, you know, um, one of the articles that you sent out, Sheila, was about inclusion of ethnic studies um, in the U.S. curriculum so that we actually understand our histories better. Um, and the fact of the matter is, like, we we don't know um, so much of U.S. history, uh, um, particularly its influence globally, um, or even even why things are the way that they are now, right? Just uh, why why are these folks forced to leave their countries and be here, right? Um, because it is a forced removal, not not of just like some whim. Um, so things of that nature. So I'm I really appreciated um, getting some context into it, but also just kind of astounded that we don't talk about it. We don't talk about the fact that we are responsible for the largest bombing ever. I think that was, you know, like per, per capita or something like that. Yeah, I, I it astounds me that we, we don't talk about that.
Yeah. And so then you have these characters who are like really just trying to live day after day. And if you don't have context, it's still like really sad and very troubling to think about what happened in their home country that made um, survival so exhausting. And then when you have context, you're like, damn, (laughs) this thing obviously carries so much more weight. But um, and then like on the next layer is because this book is set in Canada, like that type of um, like context or feeling of responsibility isn't there in the same way. Um, and all of those things together, like were marinating as I was reading, especially um, the last story with like the the worm picking and that friend who came, like this boy like clearly knows that it was friends with the, the narrator. So like may have had an inkling as to why the family was and like the community was in their town. Um, but like felt, it seemed to feel no remorse about just taking the managerial position at the age of 14 after co-opting the, the knowledge from the narrator's mother. And then so, having the nerve to like totally like uh, get rid of that the knowledge and be like, you got to do it this way. That was the part that like really, really just got me so angry. I was like, oh, the entitlement, the arrogance. And it comes in like it's... That... Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say it came in and acted like it was like a, a nice gesture, like he's going to work for free, um, which just points out that he has the privilege to be able to do that when people, as the narrator says, who are doctors and lawyers and whatever else in their own countries have to do this work as their livelihood. And then he just comes in as, oh, this will be fun. I'll have fun with this. Um, and then just takes over and yeah, like learns all the knowledge from the mother who has worked in this position for years, like just terrible. And then when he doesn't get what he wants, when the daughter turns off all the lights, when he comes to pick her up for the school dance, and he has a meltdown, he tears he tears out his hair, she said, and is sobbing and screaming. And I think that that is a really kind of wonderful, since 2016, how many times have you heard the most dangerous thing is a humiliated white man? There's some truth there. Um, there's some, um, some truth to that. And I, th- I think that that's that sense of entitlement um, that Fatima brought up is really on display. <laughs> so while we've talked about um, like the inherent sadness in a lot of these stories, um, love is also an important feeling and theme, whether it's like love of family, romantic love, love when it's failed or self-love. Um, I'm just curious if you all picked up on those themes and, uh, if there were any stories that touch, I mean, they all touch on love in certain ways, but if there was one specifically that moved you. I really love the Halloween one. Um, just the fact that the dad took them to a wealthier neighborhood that did have like a larger t- trick or treating or whatever. I, I don't know. There was something so joyous about it because it was very much like, I want my kids to have fun and I'm going to go to great lengths to do it. It was, there was a lot of care and thought behind it. Um, yeah. I, I loved everything about that story. Yeah, that was one of my favorites too. I just, um, I think because it was, it did leave you with like a sense of of joy. And even as I said before, when when the girls are determined, like, no, we said this thing. And, you know, that's their experiences. They're going to remember it. Um, And yeah, like I just finished that story and I was just like, I don't know. I, I, it was just like, nice to read something that was so filled with with their joy it kind of contrasted to the first story too like they held together in solidarity and we're like this is the thing we're saying this is our family thing which is like I think super common like families have their own weird languages all the time and so it was just super relatable and like Lucy said just endearing and joyous 
yeah and this thing of like protecting the dad like being so proud and in alignment with the dad as opposed to protecting him because the daughter is aware that he in in how to pronounce knife that he didn't know how to pronounce knife and she didn't want to humiliate him in in and so she was protecting him i mean there was a definitely like a shift in the parent child relationship there um so i i appreciate that contrast between the two stories I, I really loved oh sorry i was just gonna say one of the ones that i really loved was the uh wedding invitation man um he was <laughs> he was great and like i just like how much care he put into like making the wedding invitations perfect for everybody um and like I just really loved that character and um even the end where his daughter's like upset with him because her like to her fiance jilts her and he admits that like he like makes up that like a wedding invitation got left behind I I think that there was like a really clear through line through a lot of the like parent child relationships of people like protecting each other and like a way that was really like sweet and moving um and i don't know i loved that story i forgot about that one um i love that story too uh i was i i really i think my favorite relationship from the whole book was the foul-mouthed nail salon owner and her boxer brother um if i remember correctly that both their parents are either dead or not in canada so she has to take care of him. And I like that she does does that in a really gruff way. But it's also so obviously filled with love and humor and um, honesty. Um, that I, I just gravitate towards that sort of tough love, if you will. Um, so I think that that made me smile. Also, I you really don't see too much media about siblings, particularly a brother and a sister. And so many people have brothers and sisters, you would think that that'd be something that's more prevalent in, in culture as a whole. Yeah, this is very true. Also, about that story, I found it fascinating that more men were willing to go get pedicures once there was a male uh, pedicurist, I guess. Uh, I, I don't know what you call uh, Anyways, yeah, I, I thought that was hilarious and awesome. Yeah, no, the, the, I like that it was a sibling relationship that wasn't rooted in a fantasy of what sibling relationships are like, that they each had their own personalities, they had their own lives, that she was there for him, but she also wasn't going to coddle him. And um, sibling, like uh, mixed gendered sibling relationships are difficult. I mean, all sibling relationships are difficult, but there's like that other component um, on top of that of like gender norms and expectations. Um, and it was just like, yeah, you're right, Jacob. Like there are very, very few pieces of media that make, that illuminate that any part of like the weirdness that is a sibling relationship because it's a relationship that lasts you the longest in your life. But like, you don't, there's no guidebook to like make it healthy or to make it last. Like you can also easily just divest from it. Yeah. Um, and I really, uh, Audrey, thank you for bringing up the invitation because uh, I was reading that I just thought about like how petty like small communities can be um and it doesn't matter what community you're in like it can be like your church community it can be your golf community it can be like the Laotian community in the part of Canada and like if you know enough of the same people you just like want to find reasons to spark some drama because that is what brings you joy um and I found that like just so in the vein of reality TV and why so many people like reality TV. Um, it kind of had that same vibe to me. One other thing that your question made me think about too is just that um, I think part of why the stories had such a through line of sadness is because relationships are so complicated. And so like, there was a lot of love in all of the relationships, but I think it was a very like honest depiction of love. So like there was a wide range of experiences with like how that was shown on like both sides of the relationship and like what that looked like. Um, Cause one that really affected me was the mother daughter one where the daughter 
became estranged from her mother for, from what the mom can tell for like, who is the narrator, like not any real reason other than like, she's trying to be someone different. And her mom is symbolic of this place they came from. Um, and that one was like, just like deeply sad to me. Um, but like real and, and like very affecting, but like also the mom still trying to like check up on her, her child was like such an act of like, even though you don't want to talk to me and I don't understand why, like I still am your mom and I still want to see you. So that was something your question is not, I don't know. It just popped into my mind when you asked. <laughs> I'll be honest, I cried on that one because I can't, the whole like parents being being parents and also being sad because kids tend to be horrible to their parents sometimes. It just, you know, very emotional. <laughs> yeah, I think there were a couple lines in that that got me pretty bad. Mm -hmm. like, talking about how you like can't really do anything once your kids grow up and try your best. And I don't even have kids, but here we are. <laughs> I mean, did you guys have any feelings about how nondescript most of the settings were? Like, in all honesty, I did not realize it was Canada until I, like, was doing more, like, pulling links for the, the monthly email. I was like, oh, I, I honestly was very disappointed in myself that it wasn't an American book. So, like, now I have to explain that, like, we don't actually read Canadian books. It just happens to be this one. And it was because none of the books really gave that away or, like, reminded me that it was in a very specific context. Yeah, I think earlier in the conversation I referred to it, like American food, which obviously was Canadian. Um, so yeah, I was th thinking that a lot of these were set in America, maybe all of them <laughs> the entire time. <laughs> I think I only knew because I read the author's bio on the back of the book and it says that she's from Toronto. And I, so I, but I like definitely forgot because there's some story where they mention one of the parents is talking to a child and they talk about how like the growing season is so, so short here or something. And my brain went Michigan. And then I was like, nope, it's probably Canada. Like, cause I am from Michigan. So I default here, but like, I definitely forgot. <laughs> like, And I don't, yeah, it just felt, but a lot of these, because they were vignettes felt kind of bubbly almost like very, just like a moment. Um, I knew it was Canadian because of the stickers on my copy that said the Scotia Bank prize because I'd fallen down a YouTube wormhole about in Canada they have this amazing thing called Canada Reads which is like a primetime 8pm show that happens for like a month in the summer where they have people prominent Canadians like choose a book and they argue they come on TV and argue why Canada should read the book that they represent. So I filled on that wormhole and I was like, oh yeah, the Scotiabank Giller Prize. I'm just, I, I know all about that because, <laughs> but I, I think that some parts of this book are definitely meant to be set in Canada, but she definitely, she plays with generalities. She plays with, I don't have a good noun for it. But it's the same thing with, with the names or the locations or just the, the brevity of the stories themselves. I don't know the word I'm trying to say though. Well, I think in some cases when she leaves characters unnamed or like you can't picture a specific place, it, it, it adds a universality for other people who have been in the same experience, but it could be anywhere. Like, it, you know, just um, not to say that these characters are any person or, you know, the place is any place, but I think that it, um it does give a feeling of like well this could be something else I'm thinking of I don't know why but I think you reminded me Lucy it was kind of the it kind of was like why I think I didn't notice the unnamed characters when I was reading so much I think part of it's because like I don't know how much 
I, as a person think about where I live and because the stories are so short, I feel like it would be really weird to be like, Oh, there's that Toronto landmark or whatever. Like every single time, the, the, it, you know, like it would be like so much to be like in Canada, like in every story. So I feel like there is also just like a practical reality of being like a good writer where like, I don't think people think about their location if it's like a stable place, if that makes sense, like super top of mind all the time. Yeah. I think it could be distracting too. Like the same way that giving someone a specific name, you know, I think about like, I'm from Boston. If I read a story or a book that takes place in Boston and they have their they're writing about things specifically i'll be like well that road doesn't you know it's like you're just pulled out of the story if you are trying to follow a character's path when they're naming the streets they go down or um you know they went this direction and you're like you can't do that it's just for me it's like i can't get over that hump and um that's just (laughs) my own little thing but it's also just um you know it, it does remove that distraction if you don't have to think about the specifics yeah. I mean, I was just thinking too, even like, I feel like time wasn't even named. So sometimes even reading the story from the narration of a child, it was like, I remember being that age and I'm thinking about how the world looked to me or your friend and just like what your dad looked to you or, you know, who that figure was. So I think a lot of it, it does like, I, I think you said it great, Lucy, by saying it lends a universality to it because it's just without having all those specifics to bog down, you just really get the meat of the story so it it worked really well and I think also too it's just Toronto is so relatable like I feel like that's in my I mean it's my back door practically or whatever I you know it's just like it's just right over there so it just it seemed like I did forget that it was Canadian or would be in Canada the same Elizabeth like I would think of it as somewhat American too probably also because like something like Randy Travis which I don't know is he a Canadian musician I don't actually know if he's Canadian or American but anyway yeah (laughs) It was easy to not have to place place where it was or when it was or who it was. <laughs> That's a good point of like when it was, because I felt like a lot of them, there were no really like, there were a few that mentioned like cell phones maybe, but mm-hmm. most of them I was like, this could be like in the eighties. It could be in the seventies, sixties. Like it could be anytime really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really like that. Uh, Heidi, you're just like, yeah, it's great that there's no who, when, like you're completely issuing the five W's of like primary school writing. You're like, you don't need any of that, really. You need a plot and you need to go with it. <laughs> um, I Googled whether or not Randy Travis is Canadian and he's American. Just oh. yeah, there you go. Everyone knows. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of American artists who I find are like just amazingly popular in South Asia where I'm like, I've not really listened to them ever in America, but they're just very big there. So, yeah, it's a tasting. Not to say that Randy Travis is the equivalent of unknown in America, just for the record. <laughs> For some. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, we are coming up on the hour, so I wanted to see if there's anything else that you want to touch on um, about this book that we haven't been able to get to. I just want to say that on the cover, it's not a knife, it's a letter opener. <laughs> I want to know more. Oh, it's an it's. I think it's a nail file. Yeah, it's a. It looks like a nail the file. Nail file. Yeah. Oh, so is it like a combination of two story? That's so interesting. Okay. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah, I didn't I, notice that. I keep thinking like. I thought it was. It out. <laughs> I it thought it was like a. Pen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I, I have one last thing, and it definitely relates to the first story and the title, which is how to pronounce knife and how. Um, there's this like duality of if you learn how to read early in English and you read in your head and you don't hear a word, you mispronounce it and it's like seen as cute or maybe like a little precocious. But if you're learning English as a second, third or fourth language and you don't know how to pronounce something correctly, you're seen as dumb 
or you're not seen as like um, worthy of patience. And that's what that story really brought up for me, which is English is hard. It, it makes no sense. There are very few rules that stay consistent. Um, and yet like these teachers, and it's not like, I mean, in a lot of parts of maybe Canada, but definitely the United States, the culture still hasn't changed where teaching or educators um, aren't trying to be inclusive or like, give grace to people who may not speak English as their native language or their parents, just like how uh, frustrating that must feel to then be like, oh, but little Johnny who learned to read in his head at the age of five doesn't know how to pronounce knife because he's been pronouncing it a certain way in his head the entire time. So that was like my little like uh, really uh, reactive moment to that story. Which also makes the fact that the teacher just like totally decimated this little girl who didn't know how to pronounce it and then somehow was supposed to supposedly shown as like being really kind and caring because she let her pick out a toy after the fact from the little prize basket just made it even more painful. Like you should be a little bit more forgiving. Um, And I think that any American, uh, you know, who speaks English or have has grown up with English wants to know what that feels like if you just go to the UK and try to like listen to people that <laughs> there were so many letters dropped that I this was my first time in the UK last week and there are so many letters dropped that I was frequently like I'm trying to figure out where where is it that you're saying because the spelling does not match the spelling on my map does not match the sp- what you're saying at all Mm -hmm. Mm yeah I kind of think about that like having an experience where the dominant culture is telling you you're doing it wrong but like (laughs) if the teacher was in the other culture she would be doing it wrong like it yeah I don't know just in it (laughs) and she did name the teacher Miss Choi ah and I was like there's layers there too yeah, I picked up on that too. Hmm. Fascinating. Maybe it's because, like, if you had a teacher that was mean to you, you know, you're always going to remember the name of that teacher. Like, you might forget a lot of things about your grade school experience, but if there's one teacher that, like, you felt was treating you unfairly, and the character in this story, she's like certainly annoyed, mad at the teacher, but also just at the language, which is appropriate in that. Like, why is that? Why, if the K is there at the beginning of the word, why you not? Why is it not making a sound? And um, I think that goes to what you were saying, Sheila, about like English is really hard and it doesn't make sense, and yet there's this expectation from people who speak it, who were born speaking it, that it should be easy for someone else to pick up if they're here trying to learn it yeah well at the same time not themselves learning a second language yeah no (laughs) no need (laughs) why everybody speaks english (laughs) Um, so we are at time and i want to thank all of you for an active conversation and always making this such a delight for fatima and myself Um, for those who are watching at home. If you're ever interested in learning more about the types of books that we read or how you can get involved, please check out honoraceboookclub.com. Our main goal is to get more people to read Asian American and Pacific Islander authors. You do not have to be part of the AAPI community as evident by this conversation um, to enjoy the literature and have a good conversation about it. Yeah. And our book next month is a romance novel, The Right Swipe by Alicia Wright. So um, it should be a good romper fun. For the heat of July. (laughs) (laughs) 